I'm Brad Wilson. I'm executive director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions here at Princeton University. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're thrilled to see you uh, and uh, to welcome our guest, Stephen Sachs from Harvard. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the program, we're dedicated to exploring enduring questions of American constitutional law, Western political thought. If you'd like to learn more about everything we do, please visit our website at jmp.princeton.edu. Follow us on the various social media that are out there on our website. You can go and sign up for our newsletter and subscribe to our wonderful uh, bi-weekly podcast called Madison's Notes. Learn more about our upcoming events, both uh, virtual events and in person like today. This uh, lecture today is our annual Herbert W. Vaughn lecture on America's founding principles. Uh, we couldn't have a more apt title I think if Mr. Vaughn were with us, he would be very grateful uh, for this particular subject to be addressed, good and evil in the American founding. Uh, and I think he would also be very pleased with who our speaker is and what he brings to the table. Uh, we thank uh, Herbert W. Vaughn, known to affectionately to those of us who knew him during his life as Wiley, for generously endowing this lecture about 20 years ago now. Uh, and when he did that, he asked that the following statement be read at each of the Vaughn lectures. So I'll do that now. Uh, I'll impersonate Wiley. I, Herbert W. Vaughn, have endowed this lecture at Princeton University to promote and advance understanding of the founding principles and core doctrines of American constitutionalism. What Alexander Hamilton said to the Americans of his day remains true for Americans of every generation. Now here's Hamilton. It seems to have been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. Those of you may, uh, may recognize that as from the very first of the Federalist Papers. In my judgment, the Constitution, this is still Wiley, in my judgment, the Constitution of the United States is the greatest practical achievement of political science. The founders would probably agree with that. It is a testament to the extraordinary gifts of creativity, prudence, and high-mindedness possessed by the founders of our nation. May you be guided and inspired by their genius as you meet the challenges of the present day." End quote. Now to introduce our speaker. Stephen Sachs is the Antonin Scalia Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, where he teaches civil procedure, conflict of laws, and seminars on constitutional law. His research focuses on constitutional interpretation, federal jurisdiction, and the history of procedure. He previously taught at Duke University for 10 years and practiced in the litigation group of Mayor Brown. He clerked for Chief Justice John Roberts and for Judge, the late Judge Stephen Williams of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. He is a member of the American Law Institute, an advisor to the ALI's project on the restatement of the law, conflict of laws, a former member of the Appellate Rules Advisory Committee, and a founding member of the Academic Freedom Alliance. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Sachs's lecture today uh, will discuss how we ought to understand the founders' historical legacy, why we might respect and indeed honor their contributions with open eyes. The past few decades have seen a broad moral reevaluation of the American founding. Both on the left and on the right, many now regard the founders' ideals as less valuable and their failings as more salient. These reckonings are necessary, but they also risk missing something important, a richer and more human understanding of the past, together with a recognition of the great good 
that the American founding achieved here and elsewhere. Please join me in welcoming Professor Sachs. Thank you very much for that introduction and for the bottle of water, which I will now <laughs> take. I'm very honored this afternoon to deliver the Vaughn Lecture on America's Founding Principles. And I would like to begin with a short illustration of those principles, as expressed in the famous letter, which I'm sure many of you know, from George Washington to the Hebrew congregation in Newport, Rhode Island. In 1790, Rhode Island finally agreed to the Constitution. And in August of that year, President Washington paid Newport an official visit. Among the clergy who welcomed him to the city was Moses Satius, the warden of Congregation Yeshua Israel, a small community of Sephardic Jews. In response to the congregation's letter of congratulations, Washington wrote the following, which I hope you will indulge my reading. Gentlemen, while I receive with much satisfaction your address replete with expressions of affection and esteem, I rejoice in the opportunity of assuring you that I shall always retain a grateful remembrance of the cordial welcome I experienced in my visit to Newport from all classes of citizens. The reflection on the days of difficulty and danger which are past is rendered the more sweet from a consciousness that they are succeeded by days of uncommon prosperity and security. If we have wisdom to make the best use of the advantages with which we are now favored, we cannot fail under the just administration of a good government to become a great and happy people. The citizens of the United States of America have a right to applaud themselves for having given to mankind examples of an enlarged and liberal policy, a policy worthy of imitation. All possess alike liberty of conscience and immunities of citizenship. It is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it was by the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. It would be inconsistent with the frankness of my character not to avow that I am pleased with your favorable opinion of my administration and fervent wishes for my felicity. May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants, while every one shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. May the Father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness in our paths, and make us all in our several vocations useful here, and in his own due time and way, everlastingly happy. I don't remember when I first read Washington's letter, likely in high school. To a Jewish kid who grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, this letter of welcome from the father of his country has always been extraordinarily moving and deeply emblematic of America's promise, both to my family and to millions of others. Moses Seishas was the child of conversos, Jews who had been forcibly converted and who had preserved their faith in secret across the centuries. His father Isaac left Portugal and came to America, where Moses would co-found the Newport Bank and lead the local congregation. His brother Abraham fought as an officer in the American Revolution. His brother Benjamin co-founded the New York Stock Exchange. His brother Gershom was a cantor in New York and Philadelphia, a friend of Alexander Hamilton, a participant in Washington's first inauguration, and a trustee of Columbia College, the only Jewish trustee for a century until Benjamin Cardozo in 1929. It is hard to imagine a more American story than this, and one more representative of America's founding principles, that a family could flee oppression in the old world to build a new life in the new, a place that would give to bigotry no sanction and persecution no assistance, and where they could sit, each under their own vine and fig tree, and there would be none to make them afraid. But my topic today is not simply praise for America's founding or for its founding principles. Rather, it is good and evil in the American founding, and it is not hard to find plenty of both. As we all know, and as was mentioned a few moments ago, the past decades have seen a broad moral reevaluation of the American founding. Both on the left and the right, many now regard the founders' ideals as less valuable and their contributions less salient. On the left, the primary charge is that America has never lived up to its principles, that its principles are hypocrisies, pious frauds, 
designed to disguise the privileges of an elite and the oppression of others. How can it be said, for example, that America gives bigotry no sanction when it held millions of people in slavery based on the color of their skin and denied rights to millions of its own citizens based on their sex or their poverty? How can it be said that America gave persecution no assistance when Washington and his wife not only owned hundreds of human beings in their own right, but even sought to recapture one of them, a woman named Ona Judge, after she fled from the presidential mansion in Philadelphia? How can it be said that America let everyone sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree when it repeatedly engaged in the military conquest of its Native American neighbors? Indeed, how can we celebrate the freedom of this Newport congregation when some of its own members were themselves stained by the sin of slavery, a trade in which Abraham Satius, Moses' own brother, took shameful part? This is not nitpicking. These are deeply woven features of the founding that have affected us to the present day. And any moral outlook that insists on taking these things seriously, one that refuses to shrug them away, may understandably have some difficulty hearing unqualified praise of the founding era, or indeed seeing statues and monuments raised to its leaders. This is one side of the challenge, that America's adherence to its founding principles was always limited, always only for a few. But more recently, we've seen another side of the challenge, largely from the right, that these principles themselves have always been flawed. To these critics, the problem is not that America failed to live up to Washington's enlarged and liberal policy. Their problem is the liberalism, the effort to cabin true morals or true religion to some private sphere in favor of a public compromise with falsehood and error. To these critics, the compromises required by liberal democracy on religion, on abortion, on any issue of moral import might be seen as of a piece with the Kansas-Nebraska Act letting popular sovereignty decide whether some of the people ought to be enslaved. Thus, the state's vaunted neutrality can never be truly neutral. It is always making choices, even if it disguises those choices in the language of even-handedness. And even if the state could be neutral, they might argue, so much the worse. Neutrality between good and evil is no virtue, and extremism in defense of the good, no vice. This, then, is the challenge, both from left and right, to America's founding principles. How can it be answered? I want to suggest today that both challenges stem from a form of pessimism, but that neither is quite pessimistic enough. Both of them look at a society that we are accustomed to thinking good, and both see within it very real evils. But neither quite accepts that widespread social evil is the ordinary condition of societies and of the people who compose them. It is the circumstance in which throughout history we normally find ourselves and we have to assess both people and political regimes accordingly. As I will argue today, we ought to be absolutists about right and wrong, but relativists about praise and blame. That particular wrongs were widely practiced in the past, or indeed are now widely practiced in the present, does not make them right. Good and evil do not depend on what people around you will celebrate or condemn. But when we look at human beings in different times and places, we won't be able to understand them let alone appreciate what might be good in them or even worth celebrating in them, unless we attend to the circumstances in which we live and measure them in the same way that we routinely measure ourselves. Similarly, when we look at human governments and at the inevitable compromises they reach, we won't be able to understand them either, much less appreciate what goods they might have to offer the world if we ignore the circumstances of disagreement and division that they have to face. The principles on which America was founded the idea that it's a free country, you can go off and found your own weird commune as long as you aren't hurting anybody, have been remarkably effective over time at cabining the ever-present human impulse for power over others and at fulfilling Washington's dream of offering, quote, a safe and agreeable asylum to the virtuous and persecuted part of mankind to whatever nation they might belong. And this reliance on liberal freedoms as a second best, a modus vivendi among those who disagree, has been responsible for millions of lives lived in safety and happiness and in a historically extraordinary outpouring of freedom, creativity, and abundance. If politics is the art of the possible, we should recognize that America has achieved things that few at its founding thought possible and that its founding principles deserve much of the credit. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, we ought to recognize the seriousness of these challenges. Begin with the challenge from the left. Three years ago, during the contentious summer of 2020, when many long-standing monuments and statues began to be removed 
Some asked whether even statues of George Washington, our country's greatest founder, would have to come down. In answer, New York Times columnist Charles Blow composed an essay, Yes, Even George Washington, which I think it instructive to discuss at length. Blow argues, in short, that slave owners should not be honored with monuments in public spaces. In the essay, he describes the horrors of the Middle Passage, human beings packed into ships, chained for weeks, unable to move, many dying from disease before reaching the land where they, their children, and their children's children would work and suffer their entire lives for the profit of others. These people, Blow writes, were just as human as I am today. They loved, laughed, cried, and hurt just like I do. And so, for the people who showed up to greet these reeking vessels of human torture, to bid on its cargo, or to in any way benefit from the trade and industry that provided the demand for such a supply, he writes, I have absolute contempt. As he notes, slave owners such as Washington are often described as men and women of their age, abiding by the mores of their time. But, he argues, there were also men and women of the time who found slavery morally reprehensible. And, quote, when I hear people excuse their enslavement and torture as an artifact of the times, I'm forced to consider that if slavery were the prevailing normalcy of this time, my own enslavement would also be a shrug of the shoulders. Instead, he argues, the very idea that one group of people believe they had the right to own another human being is abhorrent and depraved. The fact that their control was enforced by violence was barbaric. On the issue of American slavery, he writes, I am an absolutist. Enslavers were amoral monsters. In considering Blow's argument, I want to begin by noting areas of agreement. Blow is right that it is all too easy to respond to historical evils with a shrug of the shoulders, that the founders were flawed people, that we grade them on a curve, and so on. He is right that many people at the founding knew slavery for the evil that it was. One of the world's first anti-slavery societies was formed in Pennsylvania in 1775. It was reconstituted in 1787 under the presidency of Ben Franklin, one of the most famous people in North America. And there were well-known abolitionists, including Franklin, in the room in Philadelphia when the Fugitive Slave Clause was added to the draft. <coughs> and most importantly, Blow is right about the horrors of slavery, and that, as Lincoln would later put it, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. If we can understand all this, we ought to be able to understand why many people might resist honoring Washington or other figures of the American founding. As Senator Charles Sumner later said in arguing against putting a bust of Chief Justice Taney in the Capitol, if a man has done evil during life, he must not be complimented in marble. Indeed, the founders might seem to be singularly undeserving of such compliments. How can they have looked at slave markets and whipping posts and not recoiled the way we recoil? How can we honor them? How can we take them as examples? How can we even understand them as people like ourselves when their moral senses seem so strangely stunted compared to our own? I want to answer these questions by explaining where Blow goes wrong, not in matters of morals, but in moral psychology. Slavery was monstrous, but the people who took part in it were not necessarily monsters, nor were they necessarily amoral. Instead, they were more like us than we might like to think. To illustrate this, consider another claim of thoroughgoing societal evil. My wife had previously worked for a nonprofit that provided legal services to PETA, the People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Her work brought me into contact with folks whose views were rather different from my own. And regardless of your own views on the topic, I want you to just to imagine for a moment the perspective and look at America through the eyes of the dedicated supporter of animal rights. They would see in the practice of eating meat of farming animals for their milk and eggs, of testing cosmetics on animals, or making clothes or shoes and their fur or their skin, a practice that is enormously widespread, generally uncriticized, except maybe by a few do-gooders or busybodies, associated with a vague sense of moral disquiet, perhaps to be abandoned in some ideal and distant future, but nonetheless, for now, an absolutely ordinary part of almost everyone's daily lives. They would see a practice that shares, in its widespread social acceptance, many of the features of the widespread social acceptance of slavery. Now, I hasten to note that some might consider this comparison inappropriate. The harms of slavery, they might correctly argue, are vast. They might even be so vast as to render improper any comparison with our treatment of animals. But I don't think that's quite right, because that's not quite how comparisons work. One can compare a puddle to Lake Superior simply because they share common features in an illuminating way, 
without suggesting that the two are of comparable size. Others might argue that the animal rights comparison is itself offensive because it endorses or even replicates the slave owner's own analogies of enslaved human beings to animals. But I don't think that's quite right either. If the essential wrong of slavery is that it treated human beings, people just like you and me, as if there were so many cattle to be used for others' benefit, then the claim of the animal rights movement is that maybe it's wrong to treat cows that way too. The point of the animal rights comparison is not that we are free to take human suffering less seriously or to make light of it, but that perhaps we ought to take animal suffering more seriously and to stop making light of it. In any case, the removal of one great societal evil in the abolition of slavery does not mean that every socially accepted evil of every size has been eliminated with it. If you prefer, instead of animal suffering, choose misogyny or xenophobia or indifference to the environment or abortion or any other evil you identify. All of these have been and may still be accepted by societies, even as some people spoke out against them. And the seriousness of evils or alleged evils like these is unfortunately not matched by society's reaction. Return to the example of animal rights. Recently, a fire in Dimmit, Texas, killed more than 18,000 cows at a dairy farm who were trapped inside and either burned or suffocated when overheated equipment ignited methane gas. This kind of story quickly disappears from the front page, if it ever gets there. The Texas Tribune, in reporting on the event, pointed out that these cows represent just a fraction of the 13 million cows raised in the state, noting in passing that during winter storm Goliath in 2015, 35,000 cattle froze to death. And these unusual events pale beside the ordinary cruelties of animal agriculture, even when practiced not by factory farms, the kinds where animals live their whole lives without being able to stand up or turn around in their cages, but by humane farmers who sell humanely raised products. Consider the following discussion of typical American egg laying practices from a book by the late Sherry Kolb and Michael Dorf. Although the wild cousins of domesticated chickens can live to be 10 years old, even hens who avoid succumbing to illness will typically be killed at about two years of age when their egg production diminishes. Accordingly, farmers must constantly replenish their supply of laying hens. Hatcheries, meanwhile, cannot determine the sex of chicks until they hatch from their shells. With no market for male layer chicks, they are killed almost immediately after hatching, regardless of whether the female layer chicks will be sent to cages in factory farms or to so-called free-range farms. How do the farmers kill male chicks? Common industry methods include suffocating them by sealing them in garbage bags, gassing them, and macerating them. That is, grinding chicks to death by feeding them along a conveyor belt into a gigantic high-speed meat grinder. It is difficult to imagine anyone thinking that maceration would count as a humane method of euthanasia for an ailing family pet. But even if one were to accept the claims of the American Veterinary Medical Association, which classifies these last two methods as humane, the truth is that many male chicks are killed by methods that the guidelines acknowledge cause serious distress, such as suffocation. <coughs> and that is to say nothing of the deprivation of life itself suffered by these millions of healthy rooster chicks. Now, those who drink milk or eat eggs are not themselves acting cruelly to cows and chickens. But it is also true that George Washington and his wife never shipped anyone across the Middle Passage. They merely <coughs> hired it done. Indeed, historians at Mount Vernon tell us that Washington raised sheep, cattle, pigs, chickens, turkeys, and geese for their meat, and that Washington enjoyed fox hunting on his estate and had a pack of hounds specifically for the purpose. This was so even though there were people at the time, just as there are today, who argued against the misuse of animals. And while the misuse of animals was not written into the Constitution the way that the Fugitive Slave Clause was, or the prohibition on Congress's restricting the slave trade before 1808, the only unamendable part of the Constitution, but wholly outside the reach of Article 5, it is hard to argue that the abuse of animals was not in its own way central to founding era American life. From the perspective of the PETA supporter, the American revolutionaries were literally fed through cruelty to animals. The Constitution and Declaration of Independence were literally written on the skin of an animal, dried and turned into parchment, perhaps one killed for the purpose. To the dedicated animal rights activists, then, what others might see as a heartwarming Thanksgiving dinner or Fourth of July barbecue might instead, as David Foster Wallace famously wrote of the Maine Lobster Festival, take on aspects of something like a Roman circus or medieval torture fest. Is it not possible, Wallace asked, that future generations will regard our own agribusiness and eating practices in much the same way we now view Nero's entertainments or Aztec sacrifices. <laughs>
Now, I am not here to, today to preach to you the cause of animal rights. For one thing, I myself am only a vegetarian. Though I've given up on eating meat, I still haven't given up the products of the Dillard Texas Dairy Farm or the chick killing egg hatcheries. And I have less excuse than most because I know what goes on there. Once you read this stuff in the phrase attributed to Wilberforce, you can never again say you did not know. Instead, I raise all this not to proselytize or to harangue or to gain converts for veganism, but just to explain, to explain how people whom I would not call amoral monsters, people like my parents or my friends, or indeed perhaps many of you, people who try hard in much of their lives to do the right thing, might nonetheless take part in what, in the fullness of time, might be widely understood to be very serious evils even when they know in more or less detail what is actually going on. A better awareness of history does not merely acquaint us with a parade of historical evils. It also proves to us beyond doubt that many people who sought to do good have been very wrong about matters of morals, and that others were right about morals but failed to act on them. The notion that the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak was observed thousands of years ago, and it has not become less true since. So to say that all of these people are amoral monsters, as Blow does, is wrong simply as a matter of moral psychology. This is not a claim of moral relativism. One can hold that the treatment of animals on factory farms as monstrous and not justified by its widespread acceptance without viewing the people who eat its produce as amoral monsters themselves. In the same way, we can affirm that what the slave owners were doing was truly monstrous and that the circumstances of their time did not justify it but we simply will not understand them properly as human beings if we see them instead as inhuman monsters and not as the same sorts of ordinary sinful humans that we see all around us today. We simply will not understand them or their societies if all that we can see in them is their indifference to human slavery. By way of comparison, in 1975, Susan Sontag had an exchange in the New York Review of Books with Adrienne Rich, who accused Sontag of underplaying the importance of misogyny in a discussion of Nazi Germany and of the growing acceptance of Leni Riefenstahl. Suppose, indeed, Sontag wrote, quoting Rich, that Nazi Germany was patriarchy in its purest, most elemental form. Where, she asked, do we rate the Kaiser's Germany, Caesarist Rome, Confucian China, Fascist Italy, Victorian England, Ms. Gandhi's India, Macho Latin America, Arab chicory from Muhammad to Gaddafi and Faisal? Most of history, alas, is patriarchal history. So distinctions will have to be made, and it is not possible to keep the feminist thread running through the explanations all the time. Virtually everything deplorable in human history furnishes material for a restatement of the feminist plaint, just as every story of a life could lead to a reflection on our common mortality and the vanity of human wishes. But if the point is to have meaning some of the time, it can't be made all of the time. And Sontag went on to say, Surely it is not treasonable to think that there are other goals than the depolarization of the two sexes, other wounds than sexual wounds, other identities than sexual identity, other politics than sexual politics, and other anti-human values than misogynist ones. Trying to reduce all these societies to questions of misogyny would erase extraordinarily important differences among them. We will not understand them or their world if we simply place them somewhere along a single axis of greater to lesser sex equality if only because there is more than one evil to worry about at a time. The danger in overlooking specific historical evils is that we might, as Blow fears, respond to human bondage with a shrug of the shoulders. But the danger posed by attention to historical evils is that in the glare of their intensity, we might miss everything else that is illuminating and valuable in human experience. An animal rights activist who could not see anything but the suffering of animals in a family is sitting down together to Thanksgiving dinner has allowed his awareness of some very great evils to blind him to some very great goods. Even Frederick Douglass, who was subject to recapture and re-enslavement in any state or territory where the stars and stripes flew, could still see something of great value in America. In his famous Fourth of July address, he insisted, notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of the nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work the downfall of slavery. And he drew encouragement rather than cynicism from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions. <laughs>
I don't think anyone today can claim more reason to hate the founders' acceptance of slavery than Douglas did. And yet many are unwilling to view the founders' principles with as much charity as he did. Indeed, our blindness towards the potential faults of the present has instead led many to take a deeply mistaken attitude toward the past. Today, they had slaves is often taken as a reason enough to disregard whatever someone from the past might otherwise have to teach us and to refuse, them to refuse to accord them honor on any ground. Those who have done evil during life, to quote Sumner again, must not be complimented in marble. But this view has a great deal of trouble once we realize how deep the societal evils go. Again, we ought to be absolutists about right and wrong, but relativists about praise and blame. If they ate meat should not be enough, even for the animal rights activist, to wipe the slate of all other achievements worth praising, then the same is true for other evils as well. It would be absurd, I suggest, to tear down statues of Martin Luther King on the ground that he was a meat eater who accepted an award from Planned Parenthood. And I think this ought to be true regardless of one's views of meat eating or abortion. It would reduce, as Sontag pointed out, all of life to a single axis. In the same way, I believe, it would be absurd to tear down statues of the American founders or of Gandhi or of the philosopher David Hume, as has indeed been suggested of late, even though all of these express truly racist sentiments toward Africans, and even though racism is truly wrong. The reason is as follows. Today, when racism is thankfully subject to social sanction, it is easy to condemn it. In that respect, we who live today are the beneficiaries of a certain kind of moral luck. The forces of social convention push us towards the correct view of an important moral issue. But it is a kind of vanity to claim this luck as something that we earned by our own merits, to engage in the historical fiction of suggesting too easily that, oh, of course, if I had been there, I would have hid those Jewish families. Or, oh, of course, I would have helped slaves escape, when we know that doing so required unusual, even extraordinary, fortitude of character. Abraham Lincoln knew better. In the same debate with Stephen Douglas, in which he spoke of the monstrous injustice of slavery, he also argued that the white people of the South, quote, are just what we would be in their situation. If slavery did not now exist among them, they would not introduce it. If it did now exist among us, we should not instantly give it up. Doubtless, there are individuals on both sides who would not hold slaves under any circumstances, and others who would gladly introduce slavery anew. We know that some Southern men free their slaves, go North, and become tip-top abolitionists, while some Northern ones go South and become most cruel <laughs> slave masters. Or as it was put by that famous writer, dissident, Nobel Prize winner, and Putin supporter, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. If only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? Today it is true that in some areas where Gandhi or Hume failed, we can easily succeed. But it is clearly false that what Gandhi or Hume achieved, we could as easily achieve. For that reason, we can honor the founders not necessarily for their characters, but for their principles and their achievements. A bust of Archimedes in a physics department is not a celebration of Archimedes' moral qualities, still less of Greek settler colonialism in Syria in Sicily, but of his reported discoveries in science, an attempt to inspire us to similar work. Likewise, a bust of Washington is not a celebration of his ownership of slaves or his participation in Indian wars, but of the work he did for his country, guiding his soldiers through the revolution, forestalling more than one military coup, and ultimately giving up his own power so that others might enjoy order and freedom. The reaction of George III who told, uh, told to Washington's leaving office was that he told a friend that Washington's refusal of a third term placed him in a light the most distinguished of any man living and that he thought him the greatest character of the age. Every era's values throw into stark relief its departure from those values. We see corruption in republics dedicated to virtue, extraordinary inequalities in supposedly socialist states, decidedly unchristian behavior by Christian kingdoms, and so on. The question for us is whom to honor and celebrate as symbols of particular values, not which human beings we should attempt to turn into idols. As Judge John Bush has put it, we should be judging the morality of the ideas and not of the people. Instead, the reason why one might object to a statue of Washington might have more to do with the present 
than with the past. There are, even today, statues in Mongolia of Chinggis Khan. Very few people object to them, even though he is among the greatest murderers of human history. Perhaps a tenth of the planet lost their lives in wars that he began for no good reason. But the reason why we can have historical distance from him and see him as a historical figure only is that he poses to us no present moral threat. No one is worried that these statues will inspire new groups of Mongols to sweep across the Central Asian steppe. But people very much are worried, and not without cause, that the sufferings of American slaves and the interests of their descendants are met today with a shrug of the shoulders. And it is for this reason that a monument to a slave owner is regarded as unacceptable. Which historical evils are seen as proper grounds for damnatio memoriae, whether slavery or racism or misogyny or religious prejudice or meat eating, depends on which evils are seen as particularly threatening today. This is not to say that such objections are in any way dishonest or in anything other than heartfelt, nor that they serve merely as political weapons, though of course just about anything can but they are presentist. They respond to present concerns. This means we have to be careful not to be misled by those concerns into disregarding what the past has to teach us. What takes the form of a heated moral <coughs> condemnation can actually be a form of moral quietism. It can lead to the conclusion that we have no need ourselves to be understanding of the possibilities of moral error because we have finally figured everything out. It suggests that we have reached a moral end of history that Hegel was wrong about 19th century Prussia, and that now the world spirit is finally done unfolding. But to declare a moral year zero is not actually progressive, because it denies the possibility of future moral progress, anything that might require another reset later on. You can only really declare year zero once. A permanent revolution only works if something, like the Little Red Book, remains unchanged against which every other social institution can be measured. Instead, the common attitude toward the disreputable past more resembles the suggestion of the legalist scholar Li Si in the reign of China's first emperor, that anyone referring to the past to criticize the present should, together with all members of his family, be put to death. <laughs> One need not go that far to realize that the wholesale rejection of the past for its failure to share the moral assumptions of the present can be a way to protect those assumptions from further moral critique. Consider, for example, the offensiveness claims leveled above against the arguments for animal rights. When we decide whether to honor figures from the past, then, it matters what we are honoring them for. To my mind, it might well be proper to take down and put in a museum a statue of Robert E. Lee, because no one can possibly praise him as a great general without remembering the cause in which he fought the cause of preserving human slavery and of betraying the country and constitution to which he had sworn oaths of support. But it is simply false that we honor Washington for, rather than in spite of, his attempt to recapture an enslaved woman seeking her freedom. Rather, we honor him for other reasons, reasons expressed in our admiration of his letter to the Hebrew congregation. If the achievements of the American Republic that he helped found, constitutional democracy, individual rights, free speech and press and religion and enterprise, the extraordinary outpouring of creativity and safety and abundance, all these things made possible. If those achievements now seem to us less impressive in global context, that might be because of their success. After all, constitutional democracies today are a dime a dozen, but that was hardly the case at the American founding, and America's example had no small amount to do with that. Even authoritarian states like Russia and China style their leaders as presidents. To downplay America's contributions because it has remade the world in its image is like accusing Shakespeare of being full of cliches because our language itself is now defined by his turns of phrase. And to downplay America's founding principles because they were often betrayed by the very founders who helped articulate them is to forget that hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue and that from the crooked timber of mankind no straight thing was ever made. I now turn to the other critique, the critique from the right, which you will be glad to learn I plan to address in rather fewer words. <laughs> in part, that's because to address the claim that America's founding principles themselves are wrong 
that the liberalism which they espouse is itself the problem. One has to have a shared set of criteria by which to evaluate those principles. And if one truly believes that only a particular form of government can be good or just, whether that's a dictatorship of the proletariat or a caliphate or a hereditary monarchy, and if America's founding principles cannot be made to support such a government, then there's just relatively little to be said. But there are some areas where I think that liberals and modern critics of liberalism can usefully speak to one another. Consider two common aspects of the critique. The first aspect is theoretical, that the neutrality that liberalism promises is impossible. Adopting a goal of neutrality merely exchanges one set of rulers for another. Thus, Washington's requirement that those under the state's protection demean themselves as good citizens in giving it, on all occasions, their effectual support. And as Dewey argued, liberty itself requires the use of coercion. One can only have laissez-faire property rights with a powerful state that will use force to protect them. Thus, every claim to liberty is arguably a claim to exercise coercive power over others. And the question is which exercises of coercion are justified, not which best promote an incoherent goal of liberty. A second feature of the critique is empirical, that liberalism simply doesn't work in practice. As Patrick Deneen portrays it, the liberalism of the 1760s and 70s leads ineluctably to the liberalism of the 1960s and 70s. It tends to demoralize society, to empty the public square of values and virtue, to draw down continually on reservoirs of social norms that are necessary to keep a good society in operation. The founding era promise that communities could build their own cities on a hill has been broken. The cities were built, but they now stand empty, and everyone has moved to Vegas instead. <laughs> to my mind, both of these critiques are deeply flawed, and they are flawed, as I said above, because they are not pessimistic enough. On the theoretical side, it's surely true that states must make choices of which freedoms to respect. Few people think that free exercise of religion, for example, should extend to the free exercise of human sacrifice. And if the state is already making that distinction, the argument goes, that it is not being truly neutral, and neutrality itself is an illusory goal. Yet there's a very significant difference between thinking that the state must make some choices and that it must make every choice, or even most choices. At this university, just like every other, some moral choices must inevitably be made by the administration, whether to serve meat in the cafeteria, whether to include tobacco stocks in the endowment, whether to include abortion in the health plan. There is no way to remain entirely neutral on those questions. But at the same time, the university also sets out areas in which it takes no position. It does not require its students or its faculty to affirm that meat eating is morally acceptable or morally reprehensible, nor does it require them to sign the 39 Articles of Religion of the Church of England. We can recognize that there are cases in which power must be exercised without forgetting that people in power often misuse it, and without forgetting the lessons of our founding principles, that the proper balance between state protection and individual choice involves a rather heavy dose of the latter. There are many things, for example, that parents might do wrong, as I know well, but only in unusual cases do we trust that a representative of the state would do better. The restriction of child neglect law to extreme cases of deprivation or abuse which ordinarily, at least in liberal states, does not usually include instructing children in what is deemed to be the wrong religion, is a consequence of this recognition. And we can also recognize the importance of state enforcement without giving up the language of liberty. It is true, for example, that the state is supposed to use force to prevent someone from being forced at gunpoint and into marriage. But it would be decidedly unhelpful to describe the liberty to choose one's own spouse without physical duress as merely one arrangement among others of coercive state power. Putting it that way leaves out almost everything informative or valuable in this right. Turn now to the empirical concern that liberalism has been tried and found wanting. The problem here is that the same argument works for illiberalism too. Attempts, for example, to promote religion by government influence in Quebec or Ireland or Spain all came to rather bad ends, bad for the religion which became associated with corruption and self-dealing, as well as for the society as a whole. And if it is true, as Edmund Waldstein recently wrote in First Things, that this is because all of these states chose too liberal a strategy, that the real illiberalism has not yet been tried, then one might ask, as Ross Douth had asked in reply, why the supporters of those governments all made such choices, and why other options seemed to them even less palatable. 
As it said in advertising, you can have the best marketing campaign in the world, but you still have to get the dogs to eat the dog food. And ultimately, a government can only teach virtue to its citizens if there are a majority of the citizens who want a particular kind of virtue to be taught. Or if a minority is given power instead, if you're lucky enough to get the right minority, and not one that decides to move on from promoting virtue to investing in corruption or preserving its own power. This is the disagreement between classical political theory, which asked how leaders could be taught to use their power in virtuous ways, and modern political theory, which assumes that power corrupts and that absolute power corrupts absolutely. The absence of good models of illiberal governments in modern times and the presence of pl plenty of cautionary tales, from Franco or Salazar on the right to Castro and Chavez on the left, suggests that the empirical argument is far from proven. And the empirical claim against liberalism has a further fault, namely that it forgets the reasons why liberalism was resorted to in the first place. The colonists in Massachusetts or in Maryland weren't necessarily seeking religious liberty, per se. Many of them were just seeking their own enclave, in which they could exercise religion in their own fashion as intolerantly as they chose. A number of people were burned for being Catholic in Puritan Massachusetts. But when they were forced to live cheek by jowl with other states promoting other religions, Puritans in Massachusetts, Anglicans in Virginia, Catholics in Maryland, and Baptists, Quakers, and who knows what else in the mid-Atlantic colonies, and forced to make common cause with them in the revolution, they found themselves forced to recognize a certain kind of liberalism simply as a means of getting along. The only provision of the original constitution on religion, that no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States, was not put in to protect individual rights, but to protect states' rights, to prevent the national government from favoring some states over others. The miracle of the American founding was that these sorts of realpolitik considerations led to a society in which millions of people could live in freedom and safety. And in this society, attempts to undo the liberal compromise may find themselves frustrated at the outset. Consider, for example, the proposal of Sora Bamari in the Wall Street Journal to restore blue laws, which required many stores to close on Sundays. Amari argues, citing the works of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, that a return to Sabbath observance is crucial to both private and public virtue. But whether he's right or wrong about that, we ought to remember that the mid-century challenges to blue laws were often brought by Orthodox Jews, those who, like Heschel, wished to observe the Sabbath, but who suffered a double penalty when they closed businesses on Saturday for their own observance and were then forced to stay closed on Sunday for the observance of others. Whatever the right answer is to blue laws, the modern objections to liberal neutrality cannot wish away the very differences in religion that previously forced toleration and acceptance on our forebears. That is why I argue that the modern critics of liberalism are insufficiently pessimistic. They underestimate the degree of division and div disagreement we actually face, and they criticize the compromises that were made without adequately considering the alternatives to compromise. As Valerie Giscard d'Estaing famously put it, there is no question of returning to the pre-1968 situation, if only for the reason that the pre-1968 situation included the conditions that led to 1968. <laughs> Liberalism may not be anyone's first best solution, but it doesn't have to be. As Scott Alexander has put it, liberalism is a technology for preventing civil war. It emerged from the experience of the 16th century in which, quote, Europe tore itself apart in some of the most brutal ways imaginable. And its sole aim is, quote, to let people live together peacefully without doing the kill people for being Protestant thing. As Alexander writes, popular historical strategies for dealing with differences have included brutally enforced conformity, brutally efficient genocide, and making sure to keep the machinery of liberalism tuned really, really carefully. Again, none of this may convince someone who finds living together peacefully less important than living together morally. Perhaps some compromises are simply too immoral to make. One thinks immediately of the many compromises with slavery, which William Lloyd Garrison condemned as a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. But those who see something deeply wrong with the way that Moses Seixas' ancestors were treated in Portugal, and who would seek to minimize the occasions on which someone must be prevented from worshiping or acting in the way their conscience demands, will understand the attractions of America's founding principles instead. Living together is not easy, and there is no guarantee that we, any more than the founders, will arrive at the right answer. In this regard, I see no course 
but to express the same hope that Washington did and to conclude as he concluded his letter. May the Father of all mercies scatter light and not darkness in our paths and make us all in our several vocations useful here and in his own due time and way everlastingly happy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I thought it was great. Um, I wanted to ask um, that you know you bring up the example of monuments and such and the complexities that um, these historical figures have. So, um, how do we go about um, not tearing down all these monuments potentially, as an example, but uh, recognizing the complexities when in reality people are short on time and etc. And when a monument is built, people look at it and they think, oh, that's great, why are we doing this? And it's, you, you can't um, necessarily give them the whole history lesson of every aspect of that person's life. So how do we split the balance of not ignoring things but still recognizing them in practical reality? I, I think that's a very difficult question. I think that um, it's certainly true that people are limited on time and that part of the point of monuments is to pick particular things we want to emphasize. I mean, there's a reason we do not do an entire one-to-one -one scale model of Washington in 1790 because it would be the size of Washington. You know, um, we can't do, uh, we can't provide all the information about the past. What we can do is select the parts of the past that we think for various reasons are worth emphasizing. And so, um, Sometimes that will involve tearing down monuments. Um, the best example I think of that, um, in Hungary, I visited the essentially graveyard of communist monuments, um, which were taken down, and it was an extraordinary experience. It was um, quite creepy to see the way in which the monuments were undeniably sending a message that <coughs> we are in power and you have to suffer under this regime. And preserving them and putting them in essentially a museum was an effective way of doing that. But for other things, I think that that would be quite inappropriate. So for instance, I think it would be wrong to take down a monument to Washington in general because of the uh, many acts that he did that we would say are morally wrong. I think instead, if one wishes to add contacts there, and one doesn't have to do, um, there are always arguments for plaques and for other ways of expressing it. There are always arguments for putting up additional monuments and additional ways of signaling. Um, the hardest thing is something like a renaming, um, which is often controversial because um, you, know, you, you can't make the name too long. Um, there's no way of adding more context and information to that. And there, I think, all you can say is trying to add in other ways rather than trying to wipe the slate clean. Thank you. Other student questions? Well, any students you can go back. Yes, go ahead. Thanks, Professor. Um, how would you respond to uh, somebody like Thomas West at uh, Hillsdale who's argued that um, the, the founders uh, certainly were not perfect, but their ideals, um, even in the you know, area of slavery, uh, were, were what eventually birthed the freedom of all Americans and, and the equality under the law um, and, and kind of contrasted to, you know, the vast majority of uh, academia on, on the other spectrum who would argue they owned slaves and therefore, uh, you know, were, were, were wrong regardless of, of their ideals. Uh, how do you reconcile those two? So, so I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the, the modern historian of slavery who noted that at the time of the American founding, freedom was the peculiar institution. That something like 70% or more of the world's population was essentially in bondage in one form or another. And it is certainly true that the experience of the Civil War 
Oh, sorry, let me, that the experience of the revolution and the messages of the revolution were definitely understood even at the time to be incompatible with slavery. A number of states enacted gradual abolition between 1776 and 1787. It was not really until the invention of the cotton gin that the idea that slavery might be a permanent institution um, was there. Many people, Washington included, just sort of assumed that it would fade away in time as the ideals of the revolution unfolded. Um, and it's certainly the case by the time we got to the Civil War that the Union very much understood its connection to human freedom as being rooted in the ideals of the founding and in the sorts of ideals that, that Washington described. So I definitely think that, that the intellectual origins of the anti-slavery movement and of uh, you know, the, the sort of enlightenment project that America was very much go together, even though we did see a great deal of slavery during the enlightenment. Um, and I, I definitely think that it is, not, it is not the principles that are at fault um, in the spread of slavery. Was it, didn't Lincoln uh, refer to the principles of the Declaration as the sheet anchor of American republicanism? Something yes, like the, the golden apple in the silver frame yeah. of the Constitution, yes. Other student questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, what is your opinion on like the um, correction of morality with versus like preserving history because like with like the taking down of these monuments Yes, like it's because these people represent these different ideals However, they also represent different parts of history like an example is like for six flags in Texas mm -hmm. They removed all six flags even though it's also technically a part of like the history of Texas with the six different flags so I I think the answer to this, there are different ways. So some things ought to be preserved simply as historical items. So for instance, the first emperor of China was not a great guy, but I would not call for tearing down all the terracotta school soldiers because you know, at this point we have such historical distance that we are not worried about anyone sort of trying, I mean, maybe we should be, but we're not worried about anyone trying to emulate this example. Um, other situations um, would be something like the sort of Hungarian example. We'd say, like, well, let's not destroy this monument, but let's move it to a museum because we no longer wish to send the message that we, the communists, are in control. Like this is a this is a communist monument. There's no point in having it here in a post-communist state. But we should not destroy it. We should put it somewhere where it can be seen and where the history lesson can still be learned. Um, Something like Six Flags in Texas, I think is a really interesting case of what my colleague Ben Idelson refers to as the etiquette of equality. That a lot of the symbolic meanings with which things are associated have more to do with people's sense of what ancillary messages are being sent by keeping it up. So for instance, there's clearly a sense in which the Six Flags over Texas is not a claim that the Confederacy is a legitimate government, any more so than it is a claim that um, you know, the, the Mexican government of Texas was sort of properly seized of its territory, or that the Republic of Texas was also great. I mean, it, it's, you could certainly understand it as a, this is just the six flags that have been over Texas. But on the other hand, if we are in a world where everyone sort of assumes that no one would fly a Confederate flag except for very bad reasons, which is not an unjustified assumption much of the time. Um, you know, what, that would be the, the source of an objection. Like, look, if I'm looking at these six flags, one of them really stands out. And it is, um, you know, it is a problem to uh, send that message in a way that we cannot avoid doing, that we cannot avoid having people draw that conclusion. <laughs> to my mind, that's the sort of thing where I would hope that sort of the context would do enough to make clear sort of what's being said. Um, you know, one suggestion that was made in the debates in the Senate over the bust of Tommy was to follow the example of uh, the Doges of Venice. So apparently, the, the, the argument in the Senate was, well, we have busts of all the other chief justices. What's wrong with having Tommy there? And the response is, well, in the hall of the Doges, there is one, um, Mario Faliero, I'm mispronouncing his name, where they just have it covered with black cloth because he tried to, he tried to do a coup against the government of Venice and was executed and was sort of ordered that his memory be removed and his coat of arms was sort of wiped off 
And so, you know, he's there in the hall. You can go to that part, but it's covered with black cloth, or at least it was at the time that Charles Sumner was speaking. And so, you know, in theory, one could imagine like draping a black cloth at the base of the Confederate flag as a way of expressing that objection without, you know, undoing it. But, but I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is there. Uh, thanks very much. I'm, I'm deeply sympathetic to your kind of politics of original sin rather than Manichaean moral furies on the left or the right. But uh, I wanted to invite you to say a little bit more about how much of a relativist you actually are about our social practices of praise and blame. Because if you're fully detaching them from an objective account of right and wrong, on what do we base them? So, is it just ideological power? Is it just, uh, uh, what is it? I'm thinking of all sorts of examples ranging from the honors we distribute in a couple of weeks at commencement, et cetera, et cetera. We do all sorts of practices of praise and blame, but if they're not accountable to an objective reality, what are they accountable to? So, so I definitely think they have to be relative to something. Um, so the, the idea is um, if we are looking back at the past or even indeed at the present and we're trying to get a sense of is this a person to be praised? Is this a person who should be presented in some way as an example? Um, you, who should have you know, their bust up on the wall in some way. Um, that is a question that we can only answer by understanding them in context in a way that is not the case for the question, did they do right on such and such an instant? That obviously depends on what the circumstances are. But um, you know, I think it is fair to say that slavery was wrong even when no one thought it so. Um, the, the example that I think of, and, and this is cited in another essay by Scott Alexander, is, um, I, I'm not familiar with this, this story independently, is that there was a rabbi known as Rabbi Zusha, Rabbi Zusha, who um, said that on his death, it said on his deathbed that he was afraid, not that God would ask him, why weren't you Moses? Or why weren't you Solomon? But he would ask him, why weren't you Rabbi Zusha? Why didn't you do what you could have done? with your capacities. And I think that's the question that we should ask both of ourselves and of the people that we praise and blame. What can we expect of them? What could they have done? And what did they do that we find admirable, even if there are many other things that we find less so? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. I was um, interested in your view. You talked about the moral absolute and, and the historical perspective on that. Um, and I was interested in your view on uh, moral progress. Uh, is that, how, how would you view that? Does that mean that if there is moral progress, are we in the present, the most moral people who've ever been around in society? Or are we, is there, are we moving back at times? Or 50 years from now, are people going to look back at us and see, call us a moral and, and on many topics, maybe PETA or other things, or global warming or others? I, I'm trying to remember exactly what the line is. Um, I, I think, and, and, and I don't think that, that, that he should have gotten away with this answer, but I think it was Zhao Enlai who was asked sort of, what do you think about Western democracy? And he said, it would be a great thing. Um, but, uh, you know, moral progress would be great. You know, it, 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 would, be, it would be great to have it. Um, I'm not confident that we necessarily do. I think we can clearly, I, I think that, you know, to the extent that we feel like we have any epistemic purchase on moral reality, we can feel confident that it's been made in a few areas. Um, and I think that uh, in other areas, perhaps less so. Um, so I would think, for example, that the PETA supporter might well say, like, well, look, there are just more animals dying in factory farms today than was the case 300 years ago by such numbers that, you know, how do we stack that up against the other kinds of progress that we have made? Um, I don't think that there's, I, I think, you know, the namesake of my chair, Antonin Scalia, was quite right about saying that, you know, sometimes societies progress and sometimes they rot. Like, there's no guarantee that, that the arc of moral progress moves only in one direction. Um, I think it's for that reason, in part, that we have to be able to say, look at these sort of people who, despite extraordinary social pressures to do otherwise, ended up doing the right thing. You know, there's a reason why, you know, Sophie Scholl is celebrated in Germany, you know, and, you know, it, it is very hard to say that sort of, oh, yes, I would have been brave enough to do things like that. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I, I come to a lot of these, and um, I, I very rarely ask for a transcript, but if it's available, uh, I'd love to get a transcript of, of what you said today. I thought it was very Oh, I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Two-part question. So first, um, the, the, the critique on the, on the former that you started with, there seems to be a jump from critique of statues, symbols, and the man to a critique of the ideals, which is the thing that gets, I think, a lot of people, um, maybe more conservative, uh, really up in arms about it, right? So I can remember when, um, and I, I'm from New Orleans, so I can, you know, the Confederate flag for a lot of people down there was just a symbol of the antebellum South. It wasn't a symbol of slavery. And, and when it became a vilified symbol and everybody had to take it down and get penalized and so on, um, then, <coughs> you know, people accepted that. But a lot of people said immediately, well, then they're going to come after the U.S. flag, you know, after that. And sure enough, you know, within a couple of years, they're kneeling at the anthem and they're insulting a lot of people because they're, they're, they're attacking the ideas, not just the symbols of slavery, but they're attacking the fundamental ideas of the, of the, of the founders that you brought out. So I'd like to, um, the first part of the question is, is I'd like to get your view on how that transition is made and how we can prevent it. And then the second, because the second part is I didn't quite understand the left, right, and maybe you can just restate it so a layman like me could understand it, but I didn't understand the critique from the right of liberalism because it sounded like uh, it, it might have been a critique of, of liberalism that jumps the, the shark and attacks the ideas, but not a, of the ideas themselves. Like conservatives, um, you know, in, in, in my viewpoint are, you know, they're constitutionalists in a lot of ways. They, they believe in subsidiarity. You know, they're not big statists, you know, and so on, and that's conservatism. So the kind of things that you mentioned and that the, that the founders agreed on, I think that's something that conservatives wholeheartedly endorse. It's just when those things are attacked by liberalism, it becomes an issue, so thank you. Thank you, so, so let me say to the second point first, which is just that the long tail of conservatism goes very far to the right. Um, it is increasingly a subject of discussion um, whether the, uh, founding principles of America, something that I would say, you know, 99% of people who self-identify as conservative are, uh, adhere to, are uh, desirable. I'm thinking, you know, I, 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 you know, know a fair number of conservative law students. There are ongoing debates about uh, con common good constitutionalism and other sort of views that would take a more dim view of liberalism in general. Um, and so I thought it worth addressing here, although numerically that is a very small part of the conservative movement, let alone the country at large. Um, on your first question, so I think that um, in some ways, just for myself, I would draw the line in between the Confederate and American flags, in part because the symbolism of the former, in addition to slavery, is hard to um, hard to reconcile, at least in my view, with being one country now. It's sort of hard to, uh, hard to take away from it, not just its association with slavery, which is the cause for which the Confederates fought, but also treason, um, which is you know, undeniably the cause for which they fought. It was the, 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 the raison d'etre of the, of the whole enterprise. Um, so if the question, so, so in part, like some lines we can only draw based on our claim of what, it is, what is morally appropriate and what not. Um, some line, you know, it's certainly true that there is a sense in which, uh, you know, I, I certainly understand the argument, like, this is a slippery slope. Once you open the door, all sorts of things will follow. And in part, that's a response to incentives. So how is it the case that there are incentives, for example, to remove the name of David Hume uh, from, you know, philosophy departments or schools in general. Um, you know, I can think of plenty of reasons why people would object to David Hume uh, as, as a philosophical matter. I can think of reasons why they would object to him personally. He undoubtedly was a racist, but in ways that have relatively little to do with his philosophy. Um, and in some areas, there seems to be gain in being essentially the first one to show that that thing you like is actually racist. Um, th this is the, the, those who are sort of more online will understand the phrase milkshake duck. Um, that, you know, oh, here's this cute duck who drinks milkshakes. Uh oh, the duck is actually racist. And so there's a worry that um, there's a, a sort of social sort of spiral that it is 
too easy and sort of too much encouraged to associate things in the past with moral disrepair and to sort of say we are therefore above that. This is a way. But I feel like the danger, of course, is that there are things in the past that are morally, you know, atrocious. And we cannot sort of claim that all attention to those things is just the kind of norm entrepreneurship that will uh, you know, allow people to, to take the stage and say, aha, I found what is wrong with David Hume and so on. Um, I don't have a clear answer to the distinction there. To my mind, um, you know, I do think that it matters that the American flag and the Confederate flag do stand to the vast majority of people for very different things. And so I myself find the American flag an inappropriate focus of protest against police violence, even if police violence is a cause very much worth protesting. Because I do not see, it, it, there's an implicit claim that this is sort of inherent to um, the, you know, what America stands for, which I reject. And so to my mind, attempting to associate those two is buying in too much to the claims of you know, the, 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 the folks who would proclaim a white man's republic and say like, no, that's not what we have. Um, it's not, um, you know, and, and we very importantly rejected that in the 14th Amendment and elsewhere. Let me just interject a couple of comments here. One of you asked whether there would be a transcript. And I'll just mention to everybody that our uh, public lectures like today are all posted online. It takes a few days, sometimes a week or more, before they get onto our website and yes. into other social media. But you can, you can visit our website, see the lecture, and there's probably, uh, there's probably some computing program that will transcribe it for you. I'm just, that's beyond me. But, uh, well, so the transcript won't be, but the television. The, the video will be available. The other thing I would say is, correct me if, if, if I'm mistaken about this, but the, the attack, you, you asked about, you didn't quite get what the attack on liberalism was from the right. Uh, and if we're talking about someone you mentioned, Patrick Deneen, um, what, who wrote a book, uh, what was the name? Why Liberalism Failed. Why Liberalism Failed. Not, I don't really regard Patrick as a, as a thoroughgoing conservative. He's, he's very, very uh, liberal in a lot of ways. But the critique, which has been picked up by a lot of young people and, and others, is that the founding uh, generation <coughs> bought into what he would call a false anthropology, a false understanding of human nature that made it too individualistic, made it to the unencumbered self uh, where the only natural thing is one's own interests, everything else is artificial, social life, government, and, and power, and so forth. So it's really a deep critique of certain aspects of Enlightenment philosophy. Uh, probably the most dramatic example would be Thomas Hobbes or someone like that. So I, I think that's the nature of the critique from the right. But the right ends up being having a lot of elements. Its interest in community and in social life matches up with a lot of leftist thinking as well. So. And the, the real question is sort of how, how much does John Locke have to do with William Brennan? I mean, that's, yeah. that's really the question. Yeah, that's right. All right. Yeah, and how much of the 1960s have to do with 1776? That's that sort of thing. Uh, okay, so, um, yes. Professor, thanks so much for the talk. It was really interesting and food for future thought. If we were to gather at the end of this week uh, for a weekend seminar on these topics and we were to go deeper into those topics, what three books would you recommend <laughs> that we Gosh. read in advance of that seminar and why? That is very difficult. I may have to get back to you on that. <laughs> All right, just stop for one. Um, I, I, I am actually having difficulty making choices, so let's talk right. after. Okay. Well, you guys will see yeah. each other later, so sure think thing. about it. Sure thing. Let's see. Yes, sir. Oh, Professor Burns. Thank you very much for a thoughtful and powerful defense of liberalism and liberal democracy. I was a little confused by the, the uh, example you gave toward the conclusion. Uh, 
about blue laws uh, and Arami's defense of them and um, your injunction that Orthodox Jews should remember that they were behind um, at least part of the effort to overturn the blue laws in the 60s. Um, I'm confused because I guess I, I'm wondering if you're suggesting that it wouldn't really make sense for Jews, Orthodox Jews, or people like Abraham Joshua Heschel to have changed their mind about that. That um, at one time they thought that it was um, oppressive for, for them, for Jewish businesses, um, to recognize to have to be <clears throat> under, under the sway of those school laws. And, but for them to have decided after 60 or so years that those blue laws, even if they supported um, Christianity or Christian practice, um, were actually better for their way of life. After all, there are many different ways that liberal democracies deal with the question of, of church and state. Um, our neighbors to the north have supported Protestant, Catholic, Islamic and Jewish schools up through grade 12. Um, other, other, other countries that are liberal democracies handle it in, in different ways than we do. Um, so why, why wouldn't it be possible to, um, for Jews to have changed their mind on that? And, and why wouldn't they, couldn't they remain good liberals and, and still expect there to be blue laws? I, I don't think at all that they couldn't have changed their mind. As I note, you know, it may be possible to structure them in such a way that you know, would, not be, would not pose the problems that, that uh, some perceived. Um, my point is merely that it is difficult in circumstances of uh, diversity and disagreement to pursue illiberal projects without very quickly being reminded of why those projects were at one time objected to. Um, so, you know, Amari's argument is in part, look, we can return to this earlier era, we can have these benefits, we can have these blue laws, and look at the arguments from Heschel in their favor, or in, in the favor of, of observing the Sabbath, not, not necessarily blue laws in particular. Um, without realizing necessarily that it was folks who wanted to be able to observe the Sabbath in their own way who objected to them. And that there may be lots of different circumstances in which the attempt by the majority to um, ease the, the, the path of, religious observ of majority religious observance can have trade-offs with religious observance by others. And that that was, in fact, one of the reasons why the state has done less to promote religious observance now than perhaps at various times in the past. I'm not saying that it's impossible or that it's ruled out by the Establishment Clause or any, you know, th th those are all separate arguments to be made in, in public policy generally, and whether one thinks the state should be promoting religious observance and what kind. I'm merely pointing out that there are reasons why we didn't do this, and some of those reasons were not merely a desire for a sort of naked public square, but rather in order to protect the religious observance of other religious groups. This may be an impossible question to answer, but when we're putting up monuments and making uh, statues, etc. Do you think we have enough information about these people? Who makes the judgment that um, the contribution, it's obvious with Washington, I mean, but with other, other people, a slave owner, let's say, who had done make, make very great contributions, but, and who released his slaves earlier than anybody else, and who treated them practically like they were family, uh, compared to a guy that was beating them beating his slaves to death. Do we have enough information, and who is it we look to to make these judgments? So I think obviously we don't have a great deal of information about the past. Um, it is hard to recover a lot of information. Um, you know, certainly people are trying now to a greater degree to determine, um, you know, especially with regard to slavery, but with regard to other questions also, um, who exactly were uh, the folks whose names are on buildings. Um, you know, the, in part, there's something that uh, poses difficulties about that because 
you know, the, the symbolic nature of the objection, which is very real. So why would we have a symbol honoring a person of this kind? Sometimes we don't even know that until we do the research and discover terrible things that we did not know. And so before it did not send any symbol, any symbolic message, but now retaining it would. And so in some ways, you know, sometimes folks are like, well, we'd just rather not know. You know, it's like, which Jones was this? We have no idea. Let's keep it that way. Um, in terms of sort of who makes these judgments, I think honestly that's just a question that we all have to deal with all the time. You know, it, it's whether, you know, whose picture we hang up in our own house is up to us. And, you know, whose name goes on a, um, you know, a, a college dormitory or something is up to the college. And, they, you know, only they can, can make the call. Um, and these are not always questions that have sort of mechanical ways of arriving at answers. Um, sometimes one is just balancing many different interests against one another. And the point that I merely am trying to make here is that we have to, when deciding what kinds of messages we wish to send, think about what it is we are honoring people for and that we are not necessarily including them in the litany of saints. Like we are not necessarily saying, this is a person without fault, or even this is a person without very grave fault, um, when we uh, recognize them that way. Thank you. <clears throat> recognizing the, the difficulty in uh, imposing morality uh, or even de deciding what is moral or immoral. I was interested that in describing <clears throat> the virtues of Washington and our, uh, the founding of our country, you did not emphasize what I can, at least I consider to be the, um, the most fundamental contribution, which is <clears throat> creating a, both a government and a political society which has the ability to ask these questions. How do we make ourselves better? <clears throat> How do we become a better society? And then, in answering that question, acting on it and making us better. The genius to be of the Constitution and of those who, uh, and of the framers, is in creating a society in which we still live, in which we are free to ask these questions, <clears throat> to come to conclusions, and then act on them, which is unique in human history, and <clears throat> a, uh, a, a contribution of such breathtaking value that, these, that we are able to engage in the type of <clears throat> evaluation of good and evil with respect to individuals in the past. I certainly don't hear much in that with which I would disagree. Um, the, um, and, and if it was Lakuta in my talk, I apologize. Certainly it is one of the great contributions of the American founding that we have both a government that is made to be responsive to popular opinion and one that is committed to enabling the channels of changing popular opinion to operate. Um, that people are able to engage in free speech and free press and to convince one another on matters of public import is an extraordinary uh, development of the founding, and I certainly do not mean to underplay that. I think it's interesting in particular that from the very beginning, the slave power was involved in restricting free speech and restricting free press. It was, um, you know, there's a, there's a great book on um, John Quincy Adams in the House after he left office as president, and the petition process, because the House had decided that in order to avoid embarrassing Southern representatives, they would not accept any petitions on the subject of uh, abolishing slavery in the District of Columbia. Um, and this was a constant source of fights. He was constantly needling other representatives. At one point, he put forward a uh, petition by slaves for the abolition of slavery, um, but then said, oh, I'm not sure whether that meets our rules, so I'll take it back. You know, just sort of constantly forcing them to confront what they were doing in trying to choke off speech and debate. Um, and you know, that in large part was one of the arguments for the 14th Amendment, that the southern states had restricted speech and press with internally and that Congress lacked any power to do anything about it. 
but I'll try and answer briefly as well. Um, well, we support a regime in Kiev today. There, George Washington is Stepan Bandera, who was a mass murderer of Jews and Poles and so forth, and that's still their hero there. That, that seems to be a huge uh, lacuna in the morals of the American government uh, to support that kind of thing. I, I think that's a good example of how public policy concerns are always rooted in the present, not the past. Well, uh, thank you for a very thoughtful comment.